round of applause here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, good morning. I'm, I'm John Craig. Um, I'm the CTO of Lucid Lights and Lucid Break and uh, inventor of Lucid Lights and Lucid Break. The Lucid Break is really the product that we took to Kickstarter, like Tom said. Um, my wife EJ is here. She's the CEO of, of Lucid Lights and also a publisher. Um, when we get to some questions, she might join me up here because she's really good at answering questions. I, I like working behind the workbench a lot, but I'll get through this okay. So a few years ago, EJ and I were at a rock concert at Fiddler's Green, and they had all these LED spinning lights and stuff that were really fun. So I started looking at, uh, well, my background is in like solar energy programming, uh, some of the world's largest sites in the 80s, um, uh, designing wind energy towers, doing software development, writing books for Microsoft, written about a dozen. So a real technical background. So I was looking at these lucid light, or at these LED lights, and thought, well, I could make something like that. That'd be a lot of fun to, to, uh, to sell here or whatever. You know, it's kind of naive at that point. <clears throat> so, um, since I like programming, electronics, LEDs, all that kind of stuff. So, in a flash of insight, I, I developed or invented Lucid Light. Took me weeks and months to develop it completely. But this is, I can show you what it does. Is it on? Yeah. So. You can, you can put any messages you want in here and go different ways, just different messages. So, um, like, <laughs> so that was Lucid Lights. Um, like Tom said, it, at, uh, at the 2007 Inventor Showcase, of won a consumer product of the year with that, which is fun. But we never have gotten it to market. A few weeks after that uh, Inventor Showcase, suddenly I had a better idea. The uh, same circuitry with a little bit of change to the algorithm could be used as an inertial brake light for bicycles. So that was lucid brake. So as soon as it settles down here, that driving down the road on a bicycle that blinks like this, when you put on your brakes, it senses the inertial change. Simple idea, but there's a lot of algorithms to it. Figured out how to get rid of rotations and uh, so bumps, well, in that case, it did go off. But bumps are mostly ignored, rotations are mostly ignored, but then braking is sensed, and fast acceleration blinks faster. I'm gonna set that there for a second. Okay, <clears throat> um, lucid, lucid brake is the lowest hanging fruit because it saves lives, potentially it has a better market potential than the lucid lights is how we looked at it. We raised some capital, got going a little bit, but recently we said Kickstarter might be the way to really get this into manufacturing finally. So that's why we decided to do that. Sorry about the, let's see. So how did we get started with Kickstarter? We started searching on, online on the internet to find out all we could about it. We went to a couple meetups, um, looked at other consumer products that were on the market and in Kickstarter like the Pebble, of course, everybody, most everybody's heard about that one. Um, found a lot of LED products, tail lights, headlights, rim lights on bicycles. Monkey lights are really fun. If you haven't seen those, that's a great video they've got online. So we decided that Lucid Break would probably kind of be of interest to the similar or same crowd on, on Kickstarter, so kind of aimed at that target. We decided, after a lot of gut guessing and stuff, that 30,000 for 30 days might be about right, based on the stuff we read about how many days to do a campaign, how much we wanted to raise. Didn't want to go too small because we wanted to look serious and, you know, like this is a real product and get that momentum. But we didn't want to go too large because we wanted to reach our goal. Jumping ahead a little bit, we didn't reach our goal, but that's okay, we learned a lot. I'll get to that in a minute. We did a lot of upfront preparation, such as uh, Google Alerts is great. You can look on the news for anything to do with Kickstarter if you set up a Google Alert. We did that. We checked with people in our networking group and with EJ's uh, long email list. Went to his two Kickstarter meetups that were, they were helpful. Spent dozens of hours and then family and friends jumped in. My sister in New York City is a media expert, so she helped also. <clears throat> 
basically we thought we were ready, but what Blue said is true. We weren't really ready. We uh, have learned a lot since then. We did pretty good. We raised 10,000. We started out um, first few days of our campaign, zoomed up, it was really good. After about, what, three to five days, it tapered off and thought, oh great. But um, that was mostly because we had like 2,000 people had written to us from a, a video on our webpage. About 2,000 people had written and said, well, we want a lucid break as soon as they're ready. So we had their mailing list. We thought, oh, that's good. We should be ready with that. And we contacted a lot of the people, but um, the first two or three days we got tons of backers, but then it tapered off real fast. But it got some good things in there too. We, $10,000 is significant. And we decided we went with plan B right after the uh, Kickstarter campaign was over and went over to Indiegogo. We had our um, mailing list of all the backers. So we said, hey, follow us over to Indiegogo and do a, basically a pre-order. And that did work. We got quite a few pre-orders in. Enough that we've gone to uh, manufacturing here in Colorado. And the first order, those 250 should be back within two weeks from now. August will be shipping. Let's see. Um, I, I don't want to re really repeat what Blue said, but he's exactly right. Uh, some of the preparation and planning that we would suggest is media experts, hire the best you can if you can do that. Uh, networking is critical. Get out there, your email list, everybody that you can connect with ahead of time. And we thought we were ready, but uh, you just can't, I can't emphasize that enough. You just gotta get out there and really connect ahead of time to get people uh, interested and ready to go. Learn from all the experts you can about how to do this. Um, one of the interesting things that we found in our was, was several lessons came up, and one of the interesting things we found out was that like 15% of the people that watched our video on the Kickstarter campaign actually became backers. I think that's a pretty high percentage. I'm not sure of that, but I think it's a pretty high percentage. The trouble is, there's millions of bikers in the, in the US and around the world. We probably only got a tiny, tiny fraction of those to actually look at our video. So again, it's getting people to come in and look at your um, campaign. That's, that's the key lesson. Uh, another lesson that uh, we learned had to do with some design issues I, I did with the uh, Lucid Brake. Um, pro professional bikers we talked to, what they wanted lightweight, so we did several things. I, I got rid of the, uh, the original prototype, had a big heavy plastic housings, you know, kind of like this. We got rid of that, got the board down to 23 grams, which is the same as the two AAA batteries, very lightweight. Um, and then somebody challenged us, well, can you put it on a helmet instead of just on a bicycle? And I figured out how to do that. A couple things we did, keeping it real lightweight. You can't even feel it on your helmet at this point. I came up with an algorithm that gets rid of the bumps and most of the rotations, so that allows it to be on a helmet so you can look around and it doesn't set it off. And. We found a, uh, we talked to Dow Corning, they have a conformal coating they suggested that, a little bit better, I'll try not to look down so much. So, I just wanna make sure I hit all the key points here real quick. So, so John, why did you decide Kickstarter rather than one of the other ones? Well, we looked, we looked at Indiegogo and we looked at Kickstarter and decided that uh, because of their model of all or nothing, it would work good for us. We needed to make sure we had enough kind of pre-orders for a lucid break that we could go to production and get, get them made. If we, didn't, if we only had to fulfill you know, a small number of them, they were gonna be really cost prohibitive. We wanted to keep the manufacturing in Colorado, which we are able to do, but it could be very expensive just to make a few. So that was the big, big critical factor. After we got through and made the $10,000 in backing, or you know, had that much backing, we decided to, to tell the people to go over to Indiegogo, and that worked. Most of them, or a significant percentage of those, came on over and really did the pre-sale, so we were able to go. Um, 
we didn't feel like we were sticking our neck out quite as much with Indiegogo at that point. So we did get production going. Uh, one of the things I did was to get rid of the power switch. If you let this sit still for um, over a minute, it'll quit blinking. And then when you pick it up and start moving, you know, move your bicycle, it'll, it'll wake up again. So all those factors in the design were good. Professional bikers liked the lightweight, but we had a couple of perception problems. And uh, you can see it on the back of EJ's helmet there. Um, where's that Capri? Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's our daughter. But um, a perception was that it should, a lot of people want it to be in standard, the way it's always been done, plastic housing. And it's completely unnecessary. This coating we found <clears throat> that's used in solar energy completely protects it. Uh, waterproofs it. You can drop it in water. It'll keep on going. Not, not a problem. So but people. The final, that's the final product as it will be on the back. Yes, but we did learn the lesson. And we right now do have a, a clip on plastic housing that goes on here. And as a bonus, the plastic housing has a two inch area where we can put a, a corporate logo or a, a fundraising logo. So after, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be going to talk to Breckenridge Brewery and Sedalia Police Department, some people that have shown interest in that. So that'll help. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the clip-on cover is really not necessary. It's completely waterproof, very lightweight. John, but it doesn't look right. Yes? So how does it attach to the helmet or the bike? Uh, that was the other thing. We talked to 3M Company, and they have a product called Dualock, which is a perception problem also, a little bit. It's not as much, but it's a really tough stuff. They use it to put metal siding up on buildings in Minnesota, and it works in all weather. Very tough. It works really good. But some people say, well, it's just like Velcro. It's not at all the same thing as Velcro. What's so, the name? Dual Lock uh, by 3M. How do you spell Dual, D-U-O? D-U-A-L, and then L-O-C-K. It's got little mushroom-headed posts on it, uh, both pieces are identical. So you can press it together and it still allows you to pull it apart, but it's, it's, it's a good holding mechanism. Is that something that you provide when you buy it or is that yes. something that you Yeah, we provide that. And the, the clip-on uh, cover will be optional. So if people want it, they can have it. John, real quick. So sure. in the end, bringing a product to market on Kickstarter, um, how are you with intellectual property issues of hey, out, uh, idea. Uh, did you already have some sort of patent protection? We've got provisional patent in place, and, and I did do a real careful search on the internet to see what other products were similar. Right. Did find a company overseas, uh, Maxon makes a similar thing, but I looked at their patent real close. They use one axis, and it's not near as sophisticated. This thing extends the state of the art a lot. They, they can't get rid of rotations, for instance. Okay. So I think we're pretty safe. We need to carry through with that so, pretty soon. I mean, and maybe just a general question about any time anybody puts a business idea or something on that, how realistic or, or what considerations do you have for somebody seeing your idea and then coming behind you with the funding? And, and it's, that's always an issue. I, we kind of feel like let's get going uh, as fast as we can and get ahead on the market. <laughs> and um, it's just like with EJ on her books for, that she publishes. People will say, well, I want to show you my book, but I'm afraid somebody will steal the idea. But nobody else is going to write your book for you. And, and I think that this is probably true here. But then again, a, a spinoff or a, a ripoff somewhere else could happen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. We would uh, cut our losses or whatever. Sure. Oh, get this product and move to Spray 2.0. So, wonder if it No, we, we set a smaller goal. What did we set our goal for? Was it? Uh, half of it, 50,000 instead of the 30,000. But we weren't actually as intent on reaching that goal. I mean, it would be fine and great if we could, but we were mostly getting those pre-orders in in a very convenient, easy way for people to understand and go do. Mm -hmm. And that did work. We're, we got enough in to be able to go to production with a little extra capital we got elsewhere. So We were able to structure our rewards on Indiegogo differently than Kickstarter because Kickstarter has a lot of rules that are very, very um, restrictive, and one of them is that you can't sell multiples, that they really talk about this is not a pre-order site. You can have one of your rewards be 
what you're going to do, but you need the other rewards to be other things. But originally we had a, the lucid brick and then the couples pack and we even had extra promotional items that went that in the family pack. They rejected all of those rewards that we couldn't do multiples there. One thing that got going to Indiegogo is that we could do multiples. We sold uh, 10 packs for the writer groups uh, couples packs and all sorts of things. So we were able to sell multiples. I think if we had had that in Kickstarter, uh, we would have raised a lot more money initially. I think that that is a restriction of Kickstarter. Kills Kickstarter. That's one of the things I really don't like about Kickstarter is. It's not only that, it's that they enforce that, um, how should we say, capriciously? One of the other things that I heard before Kickstarter was that the effect from project creators were be careful about trying to do the setting up somebody of their own store. There's been people who have not the family tax, but have tried to do like, oh, here's 200, 300, buy it, you know, and then. As Pebble, Pebble, if you look at Pebbles, yeah, Pebble raised $10 million, but they have to start your tax. Price it, right? It's because uh, this gentleman priced his and uh, sold a ton of them. And then the next thing he knew when he went to go live, those same people who purchased them were now selling them on Amazon. And so it, you know, it was to, it's important to price properly when you do these situations. It's the great, it's the right way to do it, and it's, a, it's definitely going to be to your benefit, like you said, to be able to do that type of work. But just be careful with your price points so that you don't create your own competition by selling stuff. Did you and, mention? And to that point, yeah. one of the things we did too was a thing called an early backer bonus right. where we gave a reduced price for the first few people that came in. Um, we were trying to reach the 20% uh, threshold uh, in the first couple of days, which we did. Um, but we did that by selling or, or giving a price break for the first few items that we went out. That went out. Um, our problem was they list the rewards in monetary, uh, money order, so people had to breeze past the that we could sell them for 50 bucks and then try to sell them for 100 later. Uh, well, we want the 50 dollar ones. And we got a lot of pushback on that and a lot of comments on our stuff. Well, if you can do that, why can't we all get that? And so, even though it sounded like a good idea at the time, those early <coughs> value bonuses weren't, didn't prove to be as good of a deal for us as, uh, as could be. So, those were the two things that we learned is the early value bonus was you got to do something like that. That would be kind of fun, give people the urgency to get in there and get in there first and get those early dollars. But um, don't do it with the pre sale item of your own. Experiences or, or something else. Yeah. This is more embryonic question, but it's two part. One, how did you discern that a bicycle rider would even care about a bike ride, brake ride? And two, what about the price of that? Can you repeat the questions? Oh, yeah. Um, why would, uh, how did we figure out that bicycle bikers would like to have a brake light like that? And um, what was this? Yeah, mostly the first thing we did was put up a video a couple, three years ago on our web page just to show what a lucid brake could do, the very first early prototype. And we did get a huge response. We got a lot of people. We got like over 2,000, kind of like 2,000 pre-orders, not really. I mean, they, they got on a list where as soon as we get them ready, we can let them know. That kind of thing. Yeah. There was no price on that. Yeah, that that right. It was just that we oh, so didn't didn't the technology. technology. Right. So we had that... Uh, Big list, though, and it was a good start. All right, let's move this on. I'll that just to kind sure. of clear your question is that there's another Kickstarter project about a bike accessory, and that the guy got the idea because the police stopped him for not having a light. That was me. Okay. With <laughs> 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 that in mind, I'm sure you'll cover it later. I mean, the police are not going to have a light. Uh, you know, I've been wearing that being stopped myself. And that uh, it's more on people's minds than you think, unless you're a real avid biker. Okay, we're going to make a switch here. Let's give John and EJ a big round of applause here. Let's give Jordan a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, we're going to have a little switcheroo here. We went from bike light to chin rest for violin and viola. Um, so for those of you that may not be familiar with the chin rest, um, basically it is this part right here. This is the cradle. 
This is one of the images I used for the Kickstarter campaign. Um, surprisingly, uh, well, during the Kickstarter and since the Kickstarter, there's been a lot of press about this. And one of the most common <coughs> comments I get is, I can't believe somebody hasn't done this before. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard that maybe in your own projects. Um, which it is very surprising because there are a huge number of violinists and violists that struggle with all kinds of playing related issues. The statistics are somewhere that around 80% of players will struggle with pain or playing related injuries or pain at some point in their careers. So, and in the United States alone, in disregarding anybody that's like high school age and younger, there's about 360,000 um, violinists or violists, and then if you go to China and Japan and Korea, you combine the whole world, it's definitely in the millions. I'm not really sure how many, but um, there are a lot of players who are clearly going to struggle with a lot of issues. And I guess just to give you a sense for how this arose, I struggled with those kinds of issues most of my playing life from the time I was a teenager, 13, 12, 13. And about halfway through my, my third year at Eastman, I kind of had a an aha moment, uh, my teacher was asking me to do something on the instrument and I knew what I wanted to do. I knew the angles that I needed to, to find, but the equipment that I had wasn't helping me. And it, I knew that I needed a taller chin rest. That was the primary um, thing that it was missing. Uh, but also, the, you can get taller chin rests. They're out on the market right now, but they um, still force you into positions and you get really uh, used to just adjusting yourself and knocking your head off balance and all sorts of things. And when you're in practicing for four hours a day or whatever, it's a lot of time spent twisted up in ways that aren't good, healthy for you. So um, I just, I remember I sat down with my dad, he's a mechanical engineer, so I kind of grew up around this way of thinking and had some ideas <coughs> kicking around. And we just sat down at the dinner table and um, one Christmas and came up with a concept, went to the junkyard, made a prototype the next, like over the course of the next week, and then I presented on it and won that new venture challenge at Eastman. So that was three and a half years ago. Um, and I did the Kickstarter this last December into January. So um, in terms of starting to talk about how um, I planned for the Kickstarter. In a way, the three years of development of the, the Cradle was like a, a precursor to the Kickstarter. It wasn't like uh, what Blue was talking about, like a concerted couple months effort in terms of like planning specifically for the Kickstarter. But what I was doing is putting together my language like and, and talking to people and showing it, prototypes to people, getting a sense for what made people tick, what words worked. Um, all that sort of, it was kind of like a, yeah, I mean, just really putting together my language that I then incorporated into the Kickstarter in both the text and in the video. Um, so I can't honestly say that I actually did the planning that Blue is recommending. And now that I hear him say, uh, this is what you should do, I was going, oh, I should have done that. But I mean, ultimately, it turned out to be okay. But but um, I definitely agree that um, that, that sort of concerted planning, if you haven't already sort of, well, you should do it probably anyways. I mean, I should have done it. Um, the other great thing about um, being a part of the community, I'm actually asking to buy this and uh, like, you know, a primary user of it is that I have in my social media network, most of my friends are, you know, I don't know, 300 Facebook friends, which isn't a whole lot, I don't think, maybe a little more. And, but almost all of them are in the music community because you know Facebook came out when I was just going to college and so I built that community when I was at one of the, the world's like largest music conservatories. And so my friends have networks of friends and actually the music world is surprisingly small. I mean, or at least um, you can reach a great depth quite quickly in the community. So that turned out to be huge and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so I sort of had a built-in community already. So it was, it was nice to be, I think that those two things, the fact that I spent three years putting my language together and that I was already a part of the community that I'm actually marketing for, both had a huge part in the success of the Kickstarter campaign. So here's the, a screen grab of 
the Kickstarter page as I have it, as it is right now. Um, you can see we went from December 15th to January 14th, 30 days. Um, Blue mentioned this as being the, probably the, on average, the best time frame. I, that's also by recommendation of Kickstarter. I saw some of the statistics about, you know, um, likelihood to succeed over, you know, graft, depending on how long the, the campaign was. Um, and I think actually Kickstarter recently reduced their maximum number of days from something like 90 days to 60, or maybe even be less. I can't remember specifically what it is now. But they're, they were pushing people just by the verbiage on their website to do something around 30 days. But now they're actually implementing policies that make it, you know, they're really pushing people to do that because um, it, it does actually make a lot of sense. And I did have a big dip. I'll show you that as well later on. Um, let's see. And you can see the goal is $18,000. Um, so really, kind of like what Blue showed, uh, really the, the setting the goal was not as complicated or, um, I mean, it was just a simple addition problem, mostly. And then I, I did give myself some breathing room. So you are sitting there thinking, okay, if I have a lower goal, probably more likely to reach it. But I want some like breathing room and I wanted to make sure that I could deliver on the rewards and make sure I could deliver. So I had to make sure I had enough money. Um, or at least what I thought was enough money. And it turns out that we raised 136% of the goal, um, so 24,000 up there, and I will probably still have to dip a little bit into my own funds when this is all over, because since the Kickstarter ended, uh, you know, I made the mold in Boulder, and we ran a few articles, and then there were some design modifications, and every time you make a modification, it's another $2,000 and all this time, and so, um, just the, the post Kickstarter getting the reward ready has been a lot more organic process than I originally anticipated. I was kind of thought, you know, okay, I, you know, I, I researched how much shipping fees should be. And I, then, then the USPS changed that. They added $2 per, you know, um, per thing that I'm gonna have to ship out. So that was after the Kickstarter ended. I had no idea. So, um, and then I think they changed it again, actually. Um, and then the, all the design modifications. So it turns out that it's a really good thing we raised more than the $18,000. Um, yes? What were your, an example of the rewards for this kind of a problem? Yeah, so I'm actually gonna get to that and I'll piggyback a little bit on what they were saying. In September, I believe, last September is when Kickstarter implemented the no multiples reward rule and so I had been thinking about doing a Kickstarter for months before that. So when I was, you know, in the very first stages of planning for the Kickstarter, my, I was definitely planning on doing multiple rewards because I don't, it's hard to think about how can I have somebody, how can I ask somebody to donate $300 when I'm asking, so like to get a cradle, you had to donate $75. That was where like you actually got one. There was two, the first level was $10. That was just like your name on the website and a thank you. 25 was a, a cloth, a microfiber cloth with the logo. And then $75 was the next one. What so, are they, they gonna retail for, do you think? Um, probably around 89. Um, can I, you have a question or should I finish the rewards? Or? Yeah, so um, the question is whether an 80 or $85 average for the reward compares to other campaigns. I can't speak fully on how it compares to other campaigns. I have a suspicion that Kickstarter typically um, works best for projects that have lots of smaller donations. The, the way to think about it is like this is a bunch of small donations that add up. It's not, you know, like the traditional model. So my $75 level, which is when you actually get what this project is all about, is actually probably kind of high on the higher end of that. Um, but at the same time, the community of violinists, um, especially classical musicians, which is, I'm, which is really more my community, I mean, they're buying $40,000 instruments. And if I, if I priced for what this thing actually costs to make, 
they would think, oh, this is a student thing. So I had the luxury almost of having a higher price giving that higher sense of value, which is consonant within the community. Um, but anyways, the rewards, it was really difficult with that, with that multiples. Suddenly, I couldn't give multiples. I couldn't give people two the same thing. So I kind of played a little trick on Kickstarter because what I did instead is I said, if you donate $150, which would have originally been two of these, I'll give you a viola one and a, and a violin one. Where really, it's, it's the same thing that I invented. It's the same exact thing. The only difference is that the bracket is a different size to actually attach it to the instrument. So, but of course, Kickstarter, I mean, how they wouldn't, I mean, their, their tech guys wouldn't necessarily know that. So actually, the place that I got dinged, because they, they originally did not, like the first, um, I submitted, you basically put your project together, then you submit it for, for approval, and they have some, somebody looks through it. And I had, I was, had serious worries that, that maybe I wouldn't be able to reach um, enough people to make the goal. Okay, and so I, um, uh, sorry, a lot of train of thought here. Uh, oh yeah, so, so what I did is I thought, well okay, maybe it, a lot of my friends and family might want to contribute to this project, but they're not players. So how am I gonna get these people involved? So what I did is I said, you can, donate and essentially you can send that cradle to a school of your choice and originally the language said a school of your choice and if you don't have any i'll send it to the student health office at the eastman school of music and sort of doing a little partnership right and kickstarter did not like the eastman school of music part they were they let slide that you can donate it to on behalf or you know to a school or student of your choice who could actually use one. Um, so they have that no charity rule as well. So there's no multiples and no charity on Kickstarter. So I tried to get around that. So they allowed the, you know, the, the, the school part, just not me specifically naming a school for the, um, the charity. So that's like my higher levels have that. Well, actually all of the levels for the, um, when you actually get a chin rest, have that component, like you can ship it to somebody else. Um, but the multiples thing was really difficult. I also did a, um, uh, offered, so $75 was the first one with where you get a chin rest. The next reward level was 100, and that would get you the cradle with a stainless steel bracket, which um, stainless steel is less likely to cause allergies, because the, the brackets that are normal have nickel plating, and a lot of people are allergic. So that was a way that I could kind of get some differentiation in the pricing. Uh, let's see. Sure. Yes? What, what did you have for design by the time you pushed this out? Uh, I mean, it looks like you have a full working one. Right yeah. There. Did you have a full? Yeah, this one is probably around the fourth prototype. Um, the actual final design is slightly different than this. I showed like a, just down below, and it was really interesting too because during the Kickstarter you get a lot of questions that you don't think about before. And one of, my, one of the points that I wanted to, to talk a lot about was that a good thing to do is just to Google yourself and see who's talking about it because I, like the day after, there was all these blogs and people were, there was a lot of buzz about it, but there was also a lot of naysaying happening and like, or you know, there's 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 discussion within the community about the, the, the uses of a chin rest versus a shoulder rest and all this stuff. So I got on there and like responded to people and explained why I think it's needed and was like really involved in Googling and keeping up with who, what people are saying and addressing concerns. And that helped a lot because actually it pulled a lot of people saying, you know what, I think uh, maybe I'm not 100%, but I think he like, no, you know, he really wants to make a difference and you know, whatever people thought. But, but I think that Googling and just being involved, not just in the Kickstarter posting and updates, but also just more generally in the web, web broadly helps a lot. Um, let's see, if I was going to have a couple more minutes, I would just say that the video is huge. The video I made for this, uh, Kickstarter has a lot of bullet points they think you should cover in a video. And I, my video ended up being seven minutes long. And so um, 
on the back side of the Kickstarter, once you launch your project, you have this, you have a kind of a, a dashboard and it shows you lots of different statistics. This is my project video plays to, to this day, but when the Kickstarter ended, it was in somewhere in the high 2000s, I think, but since then there's been a lot of video plays. So, but you can see only 32% of the video plays to date complete the video, completely watch the video. And I think that that's something that you would definitely want to focus on having a higher number. And that I think probably is just because it's a seven minute long video because I was kind of concerned with hitting all the bullet points that Kickstarter recommends. But you really got to pare it down. Um, let's see, I had, this is a, another part of that that dashboard, and this shows you kind of where people are coming from. This, this page goes on down, so there's lots more refers. But these are the top ones, and one of the things I, I noticed more so in the, during the campaign than, than now is that Facebook has, like my, I asked my friends to share it on Facebook, and so I was seeing, I would, every once in a while I would see a Facebook post from somebody you know, around the world, and um, nobody, I have no clue how they found it on Facebook. But anyways, Facebook accounts for the greatest percentage of dollars. But if you look, um, there's 83 pledges for Facebook. And for direct traffic, uh, well, really, people coming from my own website, almost like half the number of people on Facebook, but just a few points off of the percentage. So Facebook donors, you might get more of them, but it seems like they, at least in my case, donated a lower, lower dollar amount than if they had come from somewhere else. I'm not really sure why that could be. It could be because on my own website I had a very cohesive um, branding that the Kickstarter doesn't, the, the Kickstarter format, it makes it a little more difficult to do and it looks maybe a little more professional on my own website, but um, I just thought that was an interesting thing. Let me see. And the other thing, the last thing I'd say is that there's a really great website called KickTrack, which I think automatically just, um, imports your, starts watching your project throughout the thing. And it'll show you lots of different statistics. So they show you um, during the project, this line, this dotted line here, the goal line, that shows your projected goal if you're to continue at that rate. Uh, well, actually, no, this one stays steady, but it shows you your progress. Then they have, you know, one that shows how you're trending. So initially you can see, I mean, this kind of shows the dip, right? Because Initially, if I had continued at that trend, I would have raised 28,000. Then the second day, I would have raised almost 30,000. And then it dips, right? And there was only really one point where I wasn't gonna make the goal according to this, although that, it's, it's very nerve wracking, right? When you see this, <laughs> this happen. And, um, and then, you know, this day was, was a pretty nice day. Um, then finally, this one shows really clearly the dip. So this is a, a, a money per day, so you can see that dip. Now, mine happened to be over the holidays, like here is Christmas, right here. So, the dip, in my case, is hard to read, because there might have been, uh, been a dip also just because it was the holidays. Um, I'm not really sure, but, but it does, it is kind of nerve wracking, and this is a 30 day campaign, and I can say it, it's a, it's a interesting experience. What do you attribute like this one, yeah. like that day, I think that day was when the Strad, which is one of the String World's most prestigious publications, put a little note on their website or something. Like you can, you can go back, but then there's also more comments. See, I, there was four comments on that day. I'm not really sure, actually. I could go back and figure out why, but. Okay, maybe one quick comment here from Dave. Okay, you, you ended the campaign, what, November or December of 12? I ended the campaign January 14th. Of to, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And you're still working on getting a final production? Yes. That? And you. And uh, what, what, my, what my question is what kind of response are you having or. Yeah. Uh, for the people that actually have contributed enough or uh, donated enough to actually get the product? Sure. Sure. The, yeah. So the I question is. A delay, but I'm yeah. So the question is well, originally my delivery, my goal to deliver was in March. <laughs> and. Um, what ha this is, it's a long saga of, of this company in Boulder. I don't know, they, they sent me a Word document when they sent me the quote, which has the time estimate, and then that got, the formatting got messed up, so I didn't see the time estimate on the mold, 
And so I, they, I was under the assumption that they would get this done in a month, and then I gave myself another month of buffer, and that didn't happen. So, because the, the, the time to make the mold was actually turned out to be 10 weeks. And so, you know, um, but the really interesting thing is that if you're honest with the Kickstarter backers, they're pretty much right behind you. I've gotten maybe, the only time I've actually received any message that had any sort of um, anxiety in it was when I hadn't posted an update recently. And once I post an update, like I posted an update, you know, I've, I've had to post probably three or four I'm sorry updates, like this is why, and I give them a full explanation of why, very honestly. And I get the response back on like the comments on that update or is almost like, thanks for doing what you're doing. You know, we want it to be good. We're right there behind you. It's, it's very positive. And um, that's a, it's been a great part of the, the Kickstarter. It's just communication. And I've been really, you know, I always get nervous, like, oh gosh, I can't believe I have to send out another one of these. But in hindsight, they're always right behind you. Yes. Oh, does Lori have so many customers? Yes, I believe so. How much does she do? I can't remember. <laughs> is Lori Anderson one of my backers? And I believe so. Uh, all right, let's give George a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause to Tanya Sire. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, so we have a very different kind of project. And I know that a lot of, uh, as I researched Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and a lot of these other uh, type of crowdfunding platforms, I was looking at all of the different things that people try to uh, create and get crowdfunding for. And we were very, very different. We're a for-profit working with a non-profit. We're a social, environmental, and um, I don't know, ecology, we, we create ecosystems. We're all about food, we're all about people, we're all about food access, and it was different, it's different. It's not a widget, it's not a thing people can hold in their hands. It's not a thing most people have ever even heard of. How many of you have heard of aquaponics before? Oh good, well that's a lot of you, that's, that's better than most. Most people don't, haven't heard of it. How about grow house? How many of you have heard of the grow house? All right, one or two, a couple of you, that's fantastic. All right, so welcome to Grow House. Uh, this is an urban farm and marketplace in the middle of a food desert. It's located at 4751 York Street. So what's around York Street, anybody know? Industrial. Industrial, there is the Eaton Steel Mill, there's an oil refinery, there is railroad tracks, there's I-70, and there's the Purina Dog Chow Factory National Western Stock Show Complex. There are also thousands of people that live in that community. It's a food desert community. Food desert means they don't have a grocery store, very low income, impoverished community, as well very culturally rich. It is also considered one of the most polluted zip codes in Colorado due to the industry around it. So very much a, a group of people in need. They don't have access to a lot of quality foods, as you can imagine. They are, uh, the only food available to them is fast food, 7-Eleven, some small bodegas in that area, but not a lot of food. So the goal was to create food production in a food desert. Kind of weird stuff, especially in an old abandoned building. So my husband, uh, very unfortunately, in 2009, got laid off as the executive director of operations uh, at a large organization. He'd spent 22 years as a project manager, uh, doing a lot of very important things, and he's like, eh, what am I gonna do? And uh, I am a systems engineer, business analyst, and consultant, and I said, well, you know, maybe take some time off, try something different. So we, we, he's reading the paper one day, something he hadn't done in many years, because he never had time to, and he came across this article. Well, we'd grown a lot of food. We both, as kids, grew up growing our own food. And we said, hey, why not fish? We already had chickens, we had goats, we had a big garden in our backyard. Why not grow fish? And then he said, you know, I'm tired of, I'm tired of weeding and tilling and composting and all this stuff. How about it? Let's integrate these two. We could grow our own fish and by integrating the two, we would have more food. So it was a great connection and so, you know, we started looking at our goals. Our first goal was feed our family. So here's our kids at the grow house uh, the first day we walked in in January to start building these systems. And the next goal was connect with the community. We didn't at first realize that community was supposed to be a food desert and people with low food access. 
now we know exactly where we're supposed to be and then some. And the third goal was to create a sustainable business. He's one of those guys that uh, at first he's like, yeah, I'll take some time off. Between the time he was laid off and the time we started our business was exactly 4.2 days. <laughs> And I'm telling you, he's one of those guys that works 18-hour days. So, you know, we were at a place in time where he's like, I'm starting a business this week, all right. So we know there's problems with our current food production, and we realize that, and that's why we grow a lot of our own food. We're not people to, to get frustrated with the bad things that are going wrong. They're frustrating. We're solutions people. So we're all about trying to figure out how to fix that stuff. A friend of mine recently told us he's an op apocal optimist. I said, that's a really good way to put it. <laughs> We're about solutions. So I love this quote by Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change things, build a model that makes the existing model obsolete. So create solutions, basically, is what this is all about. And we decided that the best solar, water, nutrient collectors and energy producers, food. It's not a fad, best green technology. You're never going to eat money in the future or computers or any other things. So we decided food had to be it. It's where we've got to go. It's very much the future. So with this in mind, we started our project. We took this abandoned building. This is what it looked like when we walked in. And we repurposed it. Starting in July of 2012, we'd been there for a couple years working on small scale demonstrations. And we started repurposing the building. Grow House was able to receive some grant funding and money from Office of Economic Development, Colorado Health Foundation, and several others to build the building infrastructure. But it was our job to build the aquaponics system. So we launched our Kickstarter campaign instead of paying money out of our own pocket because we were already running a farm and that was taking most of our time and money. So with this in mind, we launched the Kickstarter to be able to fund the actual development of the aquaponics implementation. So this is August 31st. This is uh, three days before our Kickstarter completed. Every day we were working in this greenhouse with no environmental controls and it was easily 110 to 120 every single day our team was in there. So this is our team of wonderful people. And we built an aquaponics system, so November of 2012, we finished the actual construction of this system. And I'll tell you how much it cost in just a minute. So the whole purpose of this, our Kickstarter campaign was growing food, growing minds, because we're educators as well. So our first goal was to grow a lot of food. And as you can see, our greenhouse grows a lot of food. This is a small space, and I'm going to give you the stats on exactly what we grow. And this was February. So we had planted these beds 28 days before this. Gorgeous. <laughs> and we grow minds. So every month we have a group of people that comes in and gets the opportunity to learn about how to take charge of their own food production, which I think is really, really important. So this was. Uh, this is the Farm Revolution. So we're partners with a group in Florida uh, that we connect with and do um, four and five day training sessions for people that want to grow their own food on a small personal scale, schools, communities, work, uh, places of worship, or around the world. Um, and so we're partners with the Farm Revolution. So you do that in your greenhouse? Mm-hmm. So let me show you how it works. This is a group from Haiti that came in and visited. We get people from all over the world that uh, work with us at the grow house. So fish are raised in a tank. Right now we have about 300 fish. Water gravity feeds through the system to provide nourishing um, and oxygen and all that to the root system of the plants. There's a bacteria, a good bacteria, that converts the ammonia that are naturally produced by the fish into nitrogen, which is a perfect fertilizer for the plant. So we don't need all the chemicals that are typically found in agriculture. Uh, the plants absorb all these nutrients and return the water to the fish tank completely clean. So it's a bio-integrated system mimicking nature. We don't have to spend the money on the bad stuff, and we don't have to use a lot of the nasty pesticides or chemicals or other things that people are concerned about in their food. So we get fish, which you don't get in a garden, and plants, and everybody gets more to eat. You get a great protein source. So here's our facility. We have 3,000 square feet, 11,000 gallons of water. Sounds like a lot of water, but we use about 10% of traditional agriculture. 
which isn't very much. I mean, we top off a small amount of water. And the water acts as amazing geothermal buffer to allow us to capture the heat from the sun and cool uh, through the process of, of exchanging this water uh, with the plant's roots. It's amazing. Winter and summer, we grow a lot more than we ever did in the soil. We harvest about 900 vegetables per week. And that means about 20,000 pounds per year. On top of that, we harvest about 2,000 pounds of fish per year. So a lot of food, again, is produced here. And these can be modular, scalable, and reproducible just about anywhere. Real quick, the 11,000 gallon water is per week or month per week? That is a one-time fill-up, and we top off about 100 gallons roughly per week. Less in the winter because we're not uh, transpiring so much. Tilapia, we have tilapia and koi right now. We're converting to trout in the winter because they're a colder temperature fish. So you're selling the, the uh, koi? Yep. Yeah, if you're a pond guy, come on down. <laughs> All right. We do have some utilities to maintain it. And the utilities we're going, uh, we're intending to complete an off-grid system this year. So we're adding solar thermal and PV to this system so that we can remove uh, a lot of those external uh, inputs, close the loop as much as possible. So let's get to the Kickstarter piece of this. I want to make sure I stay on time. We launched our Kickstarter campaign in 2012, and it was very successful. We made the money that we were looking for. And because I'm an education person, I'm all about checklists. So I've given you a whole bunch of checklists in my presentation to be able to work through some of this stuff um, and, and get a better understanding of the pieces and parts not only I went through, but it sounds like many of the people that also were speaking went through. So finding the best fit. Kickstarter's a great one, but you've heard some of the pros and cons. We couldn't, because we were a for-profit, we couldn't go to say Beanstalk, it was a non-profit. We're not a techie company in the traditional sense of techie, and we didn't have something that people were getting, and so that kind of eliminated a couple others. I looked at Indiegogo as an option. I didn't choose it because I didn't see as many success stories at the time. It's not to say they weren't there, I just wasn't personally finding them. And the word Kickstarter just kind of rolled off the tongue. I could have probably gone to the very people that we received funding from directly, but somehow having that internet front end gave me a level of legitimacy. It wasn't like calling Aunt Sue and say, hey, can you give me $2,000? I said, go to the website and check out what we're doing, and it's a neat project. And she's like, OK, here's $2,000. So it worked out better. I didn't have to make it quite as personal. I did a ton of probably two weeks worth of research looking at projects that succeeded and failed, watching their videos, looking at their rewards, seeing their language, as we say, and trying to get a better understand of what seemed to work for people and why. You know, maybe there was a really good reason why you know, th that video really stuck with people. It was very personal or very impersonal. I recently saw one for a uh, failed project and it was the person standing in front of the camera the whole time talking just like this, and this is what they said, and this is a really great project. I can imagine why they didn't succeed. They had a great concept, but the delivery of that concept was challenge. So giving a lot more pictures and interesting things. I talked to some funding people that I knew that had recently gone through some campaigns. Several of them told me point blank, Make it personal. Get to people personally. Don't depend on the internet. Just because it happens to be on Kickstarter, don't depend on the internet to do the job of connecting to people. They don't always check their mail. They don't always look at Facebook. Maybe many of them aren't even on Facebook or Twitter or don't care. So they wanted that human connection. Write a letter, make a phone call, meet them for lunch or coffee. That was one of their suggestions. Another big suggestion they had was, Ask them directly for money. <gasps> I didn't think I could do that. It was a neat concept, but it seems so challenging to my brain to do exactly what they just said. Ask them for an amount of money. And here's the second part that really gave me a stab in the gut. If they say no, ask them why. I couldn't do it. I don't know if anybody else is stronger than I am, but honestly, I didn't feel super comfortable asking them in the first place. The last thing I could do is say, well, if you won't give me money, why won't you give me money? 
that really, really didn't feel very comfortable. So I didn't take that strategy, but I'm sure the fundraising people that are really good with this can do those things and do them well. It wasn't me, but that's where I'm at. I would say build a strategy, plan, 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 I, I, you know, plan the work, work the plan. My plan entailed a list of all of my people, networks that I could go to, friends of friends, how I should get to them. It included all the social media that I was going to include, uh, use. It included the language that I was going to use, how I would lay out the video. This was the kind of things that I attempted to plan into. And that took a couple weeks to get an understanding of what we were doing. By the way, while I was working on the Kickstarter, I was running a full farm in one location. We were building in 120 degrees, and I have three kids and another business. <laughs> so this was all the other stuff that we have going on. So this is the next piece of it. Determine how you'll manage the campaign. It's not enough to launch it. Launching is one piece, but you've got to manage it all the way along. And how are you going to do that and keep working and keep inventing and keep whatever else you're doing? So think about what would happen if you don't get the funding, and that might be a good motivator, but it also gives you a backup in case kind of a thing. In preparing to launch, I said list the people, determine your platform, set reasonable financial goals. So for us, the goal of $15,000 was how much it would cost to buy the equipment that we needed. That was really a part of it. And I completely agree with the 30 days. I think after that, you get inertia, like you just don't, put as much effort in after 30 days, 45 I think is too long. Try all the social media outlets, news outlets, create your schedule in your strategy. When are you going to go to these places? Start the PR early, not at the end, because if you get it there at the end just thinking you'll get a final push, the PR and news agents and those kind of things sit on things for a week or two and then suddenly like, hey, we'll come out next week and write an article about you. Great, the campaign's already over. So start that before you even launch your campaign. All right, the right kid video is key. It's already been said before. We had 40, 4,200 video plays, only 11% of them completed. We had 149 contributors. The interesting thing is most of the people that contributed never watched our video. They just contributed because they knew us and they knew we were doing really great things. So for them, it didn't matter at all. Our video was way too long, six and a half minutes, but I had so much good stuff to say. <laughs> Create urgency, put it to good music, and really make sure that your audio sounds good. Make it interesting. You know, lots of great pictures is really key, I think. We put some very important people into the mix. Um, we included uh, some people from the community, Kendra Sandoval, who is from the mayor's office, our uh, director at um, Denver CU Denver. So these people then could add legitimacy to what we were doing. Yeah. All right, during the campaign, we kept people informed. We sent new videos out. We reminded them it's all or nothing. Please make sure that you get it, you know, donate in time. Afterwards, obviously, thanking people for their time, uh, making sure that we got our rewards out, and I'll go through my rewards list. Um, but nobody really wanted rewards. So here's our trend. Uh, we asked for 15000 We were able to complete it. I don't know if anybody's mentioned this, but there are fees related to Kickstarter and all the other ones, about 7 to 9%. You have to get an account with Amazon to get the Kickstarter. That takes about two weeks, by the way, for them to get through all of that processing. So just make sure that you can do this. And you cannot contribute in any way, shape, or form if your credit card, your bank account information shows up, they will ax the entire amount of money that you received. So you can't donate to yourself in any way. We had a very small amount come from Kickstarter people we don't know, $2,000, $13,000 came from people that we knew. So this was all about, obviously, people that we knew. Friends and family were top of the list previous work colleagues, and then people in the food movement, business associates, and our average was anywhere from a dollar to 2,500. We had several people that donated in large quantities, but again, friends and family kind of people. So our rewards, anything from name a fish to get some training, almost all of our contributors declined. They loved the concept of aquaponics, but they didn't need anything in return, really, is what it came down to. They just wanted to contribute for the sake of contribution. But here's what they got, and here's really what we focused on. 
For them, it wasn't so much about the rewards. It was that feel-good empowerment of people. Nutritious food, job opportunities, education, stimulating a local economy, sustainability in the environment. That's what our contributors were getting in return, that feel-good that they'd done something there. So one year after Kickstarter, here's what we've accomplished. We've harvested 10,000 heads of salad and cooking greens. We've uh, sold 250 pounds of tilapia as food and sold 100 koi for profit. We've provided vegetables to market CSAs, restaurants in our neighborhood community. We've created three full-time jobs and two internships, trained 200 people in this facility, tons of data collection, and the preparation for a solar thermal project. Are you our we are uh, within inches of profitability, but it's because we added that third job position, uh, because we found a really spectacular person that really was a good fit, and so we added a third job we didn't expect to add at this point. Our future is sustainable food solutions. We are going to create a nonprofit for the research and development of these types of systems greenhouse structures and being off-grid completely. We're doing a lot of uh, science, technology, engineering, and math curriculum development for K through 12 and universities. We're implementing these projects around the world. We're working on projects in Uganda and Kenya. We're working on a project with the Lakota Nation, uh, Denver Jail, and the Denver Zoo, uh, CU Boulder Dining Center, and Warren Tech Occupational. So we've got a lot of really fantastically cool projects that are happening. And Kickstarter gave us the place to make this happen, to show people what it was like. We strongly believe that uh, food is going to be our future, and we think globally but act locally. And then we do this everywhere. We can make it reproducible. So this is my last quote. Locally grown, sustainable foods is the foundation to healthier eating, healthier lifestyles, and healthier, more vibrant communities. Kickstarter gave us the opportunity to educate, innovate, and evolve. Now we've got to take it to the next level. Wow.